What's up meatheads, Coach Mandler here, Team Swole Patrol. Got a killer video lined up for you today. My good friend, elite powerlifter, and author of the brand new and soon to be best-selling back health book, Gift of Injury, Brian Carroll himself invited me out to his compound to coach me up on what it takes to be an elite lifter. So if you are someone that is just getting into powerlifting and want to know the simple things you can do to move better under load and do so more efficiently and without any risk of serious injury, you just don't want to get snapped up, then check out the killer video I lined up for you today. I've got two more lined up for you right after this one. So check it out and make sure you learn from the master himself because Brian is at the top of the heap. There is no one better at doing the powerlifting than he is. So listen, learn, and apply what the master has to say. What's up, Paul? Brian here with Chandler Marchman, a longtime friend of mine. In this part of the video, we're going to cover the four-part warm-up system that Stuart McGill and myself, um, we advocate in our new book, Gift of Injury. And it's about the Strength Athlete's Guide to Building Resilient Strength and coming back from a back injury to rehab back to ultimate performance. So we're going to cover four parts of the warm-up that's important to do every single day. First part is simply breaking a sweat. Second part is the McGill Big 3, which we'll cover in a minute. Third part is a customized mobility movement or weak point uh, attack for the day, depending on what you're doing. And the last part is simply getting under an empty bar and greasing the groove for anywhere from 10, 20, 30 reps, depending on your ailments and your weak points. Perfect. Perfect. Well, I just, I just drove over here about 30 minutes, so I'm probably a little beat up. Definitely need some movement prep work before yeah. I get on the bar. So, 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 so we're going to start with squat today. Let's start with body weight squats. Perfect. For about sets of 12. Two sets of 12, break a sweat. And since we're squatting, it's a good idea to start greasing the groove. Makes sense. Squats. It's movement so, specific. Yeah. yeah so, so here we body go. weight squats for me. Just kind of right here. Yeah. Good. Nice movement pattern, and you know what? The way you body weight squat, most of the time you're going to end up squatting that way with a loaded bar. It's important sense. to have a nice hip hinge. Chandler's clearing his hips out of the way to start, which is perfect. He's driving his heels, and uh, he's keeping a nice flat back. We call it a neutral back, a neutral spine. Um, so there's nothing wrong with this. So again, a couple sets of this to kind of break the sweat, get the heart rate going. This is not just for the physical properties, but also the mental as well. This should be part of your, your ritual every single time you get under the bar. You know, we all have times where we're in a rush, where we have to cut a couple points out of a warm up, um, which I don't suggest. But people always ask me, Brian, what do you think? If I only have time to do two of these four parts, what do I do? It's always break a sweat and the McGill Big Three. That's always the thing that I suggest because you know, people just like I do that get under the bar, they may be able to squat 315 or 405. They start with 135, they don't take the empty bar, and they jump right to 225, which is what? Already more than 50% of their best lift for their first set, and that's not good. That's bad on many levels. It can lead to uh, uh, tissue stresses and all kinds of things. Not the good comes from it. Yes. Yeah. So unless you've been living under a rock, you know what the McGill Big 3 is, and that's the second part of our warm-up. So if you start with a bird dog for me. Right. Down on all fours. Yeah. What we focus on here is hip extension, pushing the earth away, and a good, good rule of thumb here is to hold for about five seconds per side and do about five, uh, five turns each side. So a couple cues for you to remember. Chandler, push the earth away, get taller. There you go, right there, now extend. All right, so yep. co-tracking. Yes, so right there, so make a fist, make everything hard. What you want to focus on is making a half X across. The glute guard all the way through the QL and the erector, all the way up through the rhomboid and the trap, all the way to the delt. So good. Another thing, so go ahead and push the other side back. There you go. All right. And good. So we're holding here. One cue for the leg to get good hip extension is toe down and heel back. Another thing to test to see if someone's properly stabilized here and doing it right, if you can shake them and push them over, they're not doing it right. Chandler's nice and stiff there. This builds some nice uh, neuromuscular um, uh, endurance, which is key to avoiding back injury and being able to handle load under time. Okay. All right, cool. Next part, roll the side plank. So I want you to get into a neutral plank position for me. All right. Okay. And I want you to get up. I want you to roll to your side with your rib cage and your hip being one and your pelvis being one. Get it off the floor a little bit and hold for about two seconds. And then roll to the other side. Okay, now bridge. 
I'm gonna hold for about two seconds or so. It's important not to let the rib cage and the pelvis come apart, but roll as one. Again, this should be done every single day as part of your warm up, and even for a lot of people, they tend to do it for the cool down. About four or five rolls per side with a two second hold is usually sufficient. Just keep that neutral spine. Yes. The next, I mean, as you can see, he's breathing and Chandler's yeah. in great shape. This is part of your warm up. This isn't just to condition you, but it's to get you ready for the work that's to come that day. Okay? The last part is the most tricky one the McGill curl up. A lot of people mix, mess this up because there's not really much movement in the in the cervical and the thoracic uh, spine. So people make the mistake of turning it into a regular crunch or a sit-up, and that's not what we want. So if you lay down on your back for me here. This will be good, because I've never done this, so yeah. it'll be a good for coaching. Okay. Coaching tool here. So what we want to do is put the hands under the small of the back. We want to wing the shoulder blades slightly forward. Okay, not just a little right there, just a little bit right there. Okay, you can have one leg bent and one leg flat, okay? You put it on the ground, relax, relax. And I want you to bring your chin up just enough to stiffen your core as if you're about to take a gut punch. So hard, 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 there you go, right there. Now hold that for 10 seconds, right there. See how he only has a little bit of head movement? We could probably get away with just a little bit less and get the same, there you go, right there. Nice and stiff. So again, what you would say to your client or your athlete is, if I were to step on you, how would you make this stiff? You wouldn't suck it in, you'd be pushing it out, making it nice and firm. So relax, switch legs. Now come up just enough right there. Nice, nice. You can see how hard his abs are. You can see them raising up a little bit. That's how you build not just good abdominals, but help protect your back with this three-prong system, the McGill Big Three, the Bird Dog, the Roll to Side Plank, and the McGill Curl Up. That feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. Got tightly braced, feels strong, sturdy. Yeah. There's two components here that are a big benefit. Both the acute effect, so the McGill Big 3, it creates stiffness and stays with you three to four hours according to the science, and it becomes cumulative after a period of time. So it's not saying you can get away with doing them mm -hmm. only certain days and skipping and still having that resilience, but it does stay with you over time. So if you happen to miss a little bit, maybe you can get away with that. Okay? Third part of the warm-up, C. This is greasing the groove, uh, using a specialized assistance movement to get you ready to get under the bar. And since we're starting off with squat, let's we'll start with a goblet squat to make sure we're grooving those patterns just right. So I'll grab you a dumb uh, kettlebell here. And all this, it just it feels like I'm, you're, you're basically priming your body to be optimized for the movement you're about to put yourself in. Mentally and physically, and take it from me, someone who's had a severe sacral and lumbar back injury that uh, has been my life's work over the last four and a half years, you don't want to go that route, so apply these principles before you have to rehab. Yeah, good rule of thumb. Learn yes. from other people's mistakes. Yes. <laughs> this is all about what gift injury is about. It's, it's using my mistakes, teaching you that you don't have to go down this road, and you can still get strong, but don't make the stupid mistakes that yeah. I made. Okay, we're going to start with the hip hinge again. We want to bring the back up. We want to do a rhomboid squeeze here, nice and tight. Start with the hip hinge for me. Spread the knees. Hold in. Good. Come back up, again, good, back up, hip pinch, good. So you can do these anywhere from five, eight reps or so, a couple sets. Um, by now, I can feel the temperature of his skin, he's already pretty warmed up, so uh, he's getting to the place that we want him to be before he gets under the empty barbell. And that is key. People think that they're warm, they should have their heart rate up, they should be breathing more, and they should be breaking a sweat. So that's. That's why this warm-up system works so well. It's yeah. all about preparing the body mentally and physically. I mean, that was what, probably four or five minutes. I got my heart rate up, and I'm right now, I'm in some of the best shape of my life. But right. And what's the key? Just We're that. still talking through yeah. these movements, and it still only took about five minutes. Yeah. So the last part, that's part, uh, part four, or part D, as we call it, A, B, C, and D, is simply getting under the empty bar and grooving that movement for the day that, that, that you're, you're training. So. Today's squat, we're going to get under our squat bar. If you're benching, you'd get under the bench press bar, empty. If you're deadlifting, same thing. And it applies to whether you're bodybuilding, crossfitting, Olympic lifting, grease the groove, get that neuromuscular priming going yep. for the fourth part, and be prepared for the work that's to come. All right, now that we've covered A, which is break of sweat, B, McGill Big Three, C, grease the groove with a uh, specialized movement of the day, 
D is simply getting under the empty bar and doing some reps. We're using the safety squat bar. With Chandler's injury, injury history, we have uh, some stuff going on where this bar suits him a little bit better. And in gift of injury, we always talk about use the tools that suit you, not the tools that suit your favorite social media hero. Right. So we're going to get under the bar, and we're actually going to talk you through the squat in a little bit for the sake of it. We're going to have him just walk it out, and we're going to kind of go over the, the groove here and, and get about 10 reps or so at least. There. Nice solid walk out here. Good. You get a nice hip hinge. Greasing the groove. Perfect. Chandler's got good genetics, nice and shallow hips where you can keep that upright torso, not go into a bunch of butt wink and hit really good depth, uh, no matter what his goals are, whether it be Olympic lifting or power lifting or just kind of a power building hybrid style that a lot of guys are going after right now. So that's a nice groove. Head is neutral, nice hip hinge, knees are staying out. He's not getting a bunch of knee over toe action here. He's driving his heels to the floor, looking good. Go ahead and rack that for me. All right, now that we've covered the four part warm up, we're going to get into the squat. We're going to give you five cues that we're going to go over real quick and then we're going to directly apply under the bar. Perfect. First one is mentality when you approach the bar. Head to toe tightness, you're going to use that stiffness that you developed through doing the McGill 3 every day and of course uh, just a minute ago. And carry that over to having the, the segments of the body move that are supposed to move, your hips and your ball and socket joint, your shoulders and hips, and then everything that's supposed to stay stiff is, is the, the torso, of course. So we're going to carry that over into the squat. So head and toe stiffness when approaching the bar. You treat every weight the same. That's something that I didn't do in my, in my former uh, lifting days that made me pay the piper quite dearly with my back injury. I would only take... Uh, I would only take a serious approach to the weights that were heavy, more like 70-80%. And we're talking 900 1,000 pounds at that point, and it's too late once you do that. So um, the biggest thing we hammer home in gift of injury is treating every weight the same no matter whether it's bar or 1,000 pounds. So I want Chandler to approach the bar as if it's his max weight. So that's point number one. Point number two or cue number two would be lining up under the bar and putting 10 or 20% tension into the bar so whenever you're ready, you're primed, mm -hmm. you just pop it out of the rack, right? Gotcha. So you're nice and ready, you're nice and tight, so that carries over from point one very well. Third point, ideally you would have about three steps you would walk out. Two, if you could do it perfect, meaning one, wow. two, a lot of the time there's a third step to settle up your yeah. feet, right? Because yeah. yeah. you don't want to be, you're not going to be perfect every time, but you don't want to be very asymmetrical either when approaching, right? Especially when the weights start getting You don't want to waste that gas either, man. Right. You see some people pick the bar up and take five or six steps. Well, they're actually, a little bit. Yeah. Or they'll be in the gym, they'll actually walk it all the way out of the rack to the middle of the gym floor. I don't get that either. Okay, so there's three points right there. Fourth point is using the hip hinge to stay in line, to stack vertebral column, having a nice neutral spine, keeping the head... Uh, fixed on a, a place that's not straight up or not straight down. Now, again, if you have someone that has a, a longer neck, mm -hmm. they're going to have to look at a slightly different angle, but being that you have average proportions, I would say I'm going to have Chandler look just above where this poster is on the wall. So it's going to be just slightly up from looking straight right. ahead. About what, 15 to 30 degrees? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's only going to be a slight adjustment from looking straight ahead. Again, for you bros that train in the gym, do not look at yourself in the mirror. Look straight ahead, slightly up, and only focus on what you need to focus, and that's not watching yourself in the mirror. This pertains to the squat and the deadlift. The last point, with the nice uh, hip hinge and the neutral spine, when you hit depth, depending on what you're training and what your goals are, you're going to simply drive your heels through the floor, pull your lats down, and maintain that neutral spine all the way through the top of the lift. That's okay. what you call a lifter's wedge. Yes. Like always talking about it, man. Always talking always about always lifter's talking about wedge. It. Lifter's wedge is locking in the chest. You don't want it up and too proud. You don't want it down. You want it nice and neutral. You want your lats, which again, it's a huge muscle. If you're not utilizing locking, locking in your lats, which run approximately here, all the way down to your butt, that's a huge muscle that you're missing out on that will instant, instantly carry over yeah. to more pounds lifted and help protect yeah, it, it insulates everything during yes. the lift. When you're under load, yep. it just insulates the spine and keeps you from, from digging it up. <laughs> yep, yep, and that's what we're all about. And we hammer it home over and over, get to injury. We've seen people that not only are causing their pain by their lifting form, but they're they have energy leakages everywhere. And that's yeah, power areas that yep. should not be moving that are moving that mm -hmm. sap your energy. 
And we see people that tweak a couple things right away on their lifts. Not only do they get out of pain, but they end up lifting sometimes 10% more yeah. right away just by being more efficient. Mm -hmm. Do they get stronger? Kind of, because they're utilizing yeah. the strength they have and actually having it uh, in their line of drive yeah. with the lift. So uh, with that said, we're gonna kind of go through those five points now. So if you kind of turn around and face that bar with some intensity. Again, we're going light here. We just did the bar for the warm up, but just for you know, showing you guys at home that it has to be treated the same no matter the bar or five wheels on a side. So nice. So three step walk out, two steps ideal. So everything's lined up, everything's neutral. He's got the lifters wedge, he's got his lats pulled down. This first movement's gonna be his hip hinge, right? Head's nice and neutral. So sit in the hole for me, right there. It's a nice flat back, okay? To initiate the drive out of the hole, all he does is maintain this, drive his heels to the floor, okay? So again, with the walkout, the head to the stiffness, the hip hinge to start it. So go ahead and hip hinge. Nice flat back here, good head position, good lifter's wedge, and all he does to come out of the hole is drive his heels. Just like a standing leg press, just like a deadlift in a lot of ways. So go ahead and wrap it for me. All right, so as you can see, we added a little bit of weight on the bar. And one key point here is nothing's gonna change. You're nice and warm, you got a nice sheen of oil on you right now, you're nice and warmed up. That's key, he only has one plate on there, he's breathing heavy, he's warm, he's primed. Now we're gonna make sure these cues still adhere when the weight starts getting heavier. Anyone can take an unloaded bar at 135 with really good form, but when we start stacking two and three plates on there, that's where we're gonna have a, a form start to break down. And then we're gonna diagnose some weak points and probably give Chandler some good assistance moves that we really lay out in the gift of injury of how to self-diagnose your coaching weaknesses, apply them, and set up your training according to what you need to be doing and what you suck at. Okay? The intuitive. That's, yes. that's what you were talking about. Yes. The intuitive. Okay. So we're approaching the bar with head-to-toe tightness here. Everything is the antithesis of casual. Okay? So we're locking in. He's going to put about 10 or 20 percent of tension in the bar and he's ready to pop it out. A couple steps to walk out. Nice three-step walk out. Again, he's going to suck his air in, make everything stiff, like with the McGill curl up, like he's going to take a gut punch. Nice hip hinge here. He's going to get back, and he's going to drive his heels through the floor to come up. Boom, just like that. One more, Chandler. Perfect. Drive heels through the floor. Up. Good. Back in. Perfect. All right, now that we've seen the perfect locked in form with the one plate, we're going to go up to two plates now. And again, we're going to observe and make sure that these cues stay locked in and don't change one bit as we go through another two reps with this. So again, the five cues. Approaching the bar with head to stiffness. Um, mindfulness, mindfulness, fullness training no matter what. Not mindlessness, but mindfulness. 10 or 20% tension into the bar. Nice three-step walk out. Suck your air in. Hip hinge. And drive your heels to the floor. Again, good, you don't have to pause this when you can go full speed here. And boom, good, back in the rack. Perfect. Now that we've already hit the two plates, we're going to move to singles. And something we advise a lot, especially to people that are working on their form, is to move to singles because a lot of the time, people are a little bit distracted with the reps that they've already done or the reps they have to do. So now that we're starting to get a little bit up in weight, and don't mistake these three plates on the safety squat bar as something light. This bar causes all kinds of problems for people, the way it sits across the neck and pulls you out of your, your perfect uh, leverage points in many cases. So the weight's starting to get a little heavy here. We're going to move to singles, and we're going to see how this form sticks. And maybe we start to see a couple weak points that we can assign some corrective exercises for. Perfect. All right. So again, head to toe tightness here. Now you're settling under the bar, I want you to wedge. We're already, we're already solidifying the lifted wedge here by pushing that effort and priming the neuromuscular system uh, 10 to 20% into the bar. Nice walk out here. He's going to suck air into his gut. Use a hip hinge. And then come down and drive up. Good. Nice. Rack it. So what we saw here is the, the, the bar speed is starting to slow down a little bit, out of the hole and into the mid-range, but then he locked it out really quick. So that, what that tells me, again, it might not be exact, but what it tells me is you're very quad dominant and you're a little bit slow out of the hole as the weight gets heavier. So for you, 
Some speed work would be good to practice firing out of the hole. Also, some pod squats or low box squats yeah. would be good to do to get you used to not only firing out of the hole, but addressing the hips and the hamstrings in the very bottom of the squat, whereas you're more quad dominant. Now, would you do that as your, your core lift protocol, or would you do it after that core lift as that kind of supplemental work? So the way I usually do it is I, I still have the person free squat. That'll still be their main movement of the day. And then for your assistance work, we would look at doing a low box squat or a pause squat. Okay. And then from there, we would do the more low hanging fruit, the, maybe you know some, uh, uh, some kettlebell swings for the hips yeah. and the glutes. You know, little things that aren't as taxing as a box squat or a pause squat. Right, right. So that'd be on down the road a little bit. And again, we teach you how to select your assistance movements and we teach you how to be your own coach too, right. by, by programming. And it's not just a matter of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. You try a movement or two for a little bit of time, give it four, five, six weeks. If it works, keep it. If not, replace it. So it's not about just changing everything at once, but focusing on your assistance work to improve your weak points. Perfect. Hey guys, thanks for checking out today's video. If you like what you saw and you want to learn more about not just the McGill warm-up and how it feeds into a proper squat protocol, but how to take that warm-up and feed it into both a deadlift and a bench press protocol so you can maximize your performance and improve your overall back health, then let me know by hitting the like button and I'll be sure to put out those videos in the future as well. And if you want to take that to the next level and learn all the simple tricks that Brian has compiled and put together in the book that he just co-authored with back specialist Dr. Stu McGill, then simply head down to the description box right now and click on the first link that you see down there. This is an absolutely unbelievable book that will absolutely reinvent your body in the way it moves. It has dramatically improved my overall health and is something that even if you're not a power lifter, you can definitely get great value from by simply improving the way you move under load. So if you're squatting, benching, or deadlifting, this is definitely something that is a mandatory read for the quality of how you move now and the quality of your health in the future. Definitely want to check this out and you can do so right now by clicking on that first link that you see down there in the description box. Appreciate your time guys. Have a good one. Mandler out.